Good evening. How are you tonight? Again, may I have the privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit with you for a little while. What would you like to talk about this evening on this anonymous telephone program? What subject is of concern to you? This is a program where we are enormously interested in the Bible. The Bible is the Word of God. It is that wonderful book that God has given us. It is the law book of God uh, telling us how we are to live, giving us the prin excuse me, the principles and the rules by which we are to live. And of course, it also uh, stipulates what the penalties are when we do not live in this way. And because we're all created in the image of God, therefore, someday we have to answer to God for the kind of life that we have lived. And this is deadly serious business. And that's why it is so wonderful that we talk about it now. Because today is the day of salvation. Today there is a way of escape from coming out to, by which we can come out from under the wrath of God that we so rightly deserve. That wrath comes upon those who have broken God's laws, and every human being has broken God's laws. So this is what we talk about. We really want to know more and more about what the Bible teaches. That we better know about because the Bible is written to us, to you, yes, to you, whoever you are, wherever you are, and to me. N neither of us is excluded. God has something to say to each of us, and that's true of every human on the face of the earth. And it's only too wonderful that we can take a program like this and dedicate it to the idea of learning what does God have to tell us. Now, we have listeners in many, many countries because we broadcast... Uh, in great areas of the world and and also translate this program into many many languages in the English language it also goes to England uh, over there in Europe and we have a question from uh, a town by the name of Smithwick England which is a very significant question please explain Ephesians 5 23 to 29 and Ephesians 5 verse 32 if the church age is finished, where and when does the eternal church begin? Well, now in Ephesians 5, God is talking about the church. And most Bible teachers and pastors and so on read this and immediately think of their local congregation. Uh, because uh, what they read here, they hope, is true of their local congregation. In fact, that's the only church that they can really know about and uh, have any true idea of. Uh, we read in, uh, in, uh, in uh, verse 23, and God is using the illustration of the human marriage, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish and then verse 32 uh, this is a great mystery but I speak concerning Christ and the church now the question is, when God is talking about the churches here, church in this passage, and he uses that word church repeatedly, is he talking about the local congregation? And I can assure you, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Now that's horrible 
uh, a pastor will say or any uh, good church member will say, wait a minute, wait a minute. We are the church, aren't we? We're the local congregation here that is called the church. Well, yes, we externally, there are those who belong to a, a institution called a local congregation. But that local congregation, and this is something that that uh, pastors and Bible teachers and church members don't like to really face up honestly to, is the, the fact is that just because you have what you believe is a saved membership in your congregation, after all, you don't allow anyone to be a member in full communion unless they have made a proper uh, profession of faith, they have been baptized in water, and uh, they have agreed to, to uh, uh, be faithful to all the teachings of this congregation, doesn't that mean that he is a true believer in the Lord Jesus? And that's what the church would like to believe to be true. But it isn't true. It is not true at all. Because nobody can look into the hearts of everyone who becomes a member of a congregation. Nobody can. Only God can. And so while we may have what we hope is a saved membership, it doesn't necessarily mean that is so at all. All we have to do is look at the seven churches that are recorded for us in Revelation 2 and Revelation 3. Uh, and this was only a few decades after they had begun, well, or there was still a lot of the excitement of being faithful altogether to the Word of God. And yet already the Sardis uh, church at Sardis was a dead church. It only had a few true believers within it. And, uh, and there were other churches that had, uh, had uh, Satan living there. In other words, there were those in the congregation who appeared to be true believers, but they were still enslaved to Satan. And Satan, of course, uh, looks like an angel of light, and so uh, these people uh, also look like they were true believers, but in actuality they were not. No, a local congregation can never be the bride of Christ. A local congregation as a whole congregation will never be what is said here that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle. That's impossible because that would mean God would have to have only in that congregation true believers and never in the history of the world has, could we ever say that any congregation is made up of only true believers. No, the church that God has in mind here in Ephesians 5 is the eternal church. Anytime somebody became saved, whether they became saved 13,000 years ago or whether they became saved uh, uh, 6,000 years ago or if they became saved 2,000 years ago or yesterday makes no difference if we became a true child of God, if we truly became saved then automatically we are an eternal member of the church or that is we're a member of the eternal church and uh, this is because we have been given eternal life and forever we are in uh, in uh, forever we are the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ and and this is the church that Christ gave himself for he did not he did not pay for the sins of everyone in the local congregation he paid for the sins of everyone in the local congregation or outside of the local congregation who truly became a true believer and so when a question is raised from our friend in England Oh, where, what happened to the eternal church? Well, it keeps going. It has been being, it is being built, and it'll continue right until Christ returns on the last day. As we are bringing the gospel today, 
from uh, uh, sources outside of the local congregation and there are a great multitude of people being saved and we know this to be so because God himself promises that in Revelation 7 we know that all of those who do become saved we don't know who they are they, they can be sprinkled anywhere at all in the world they uh, most of the people today probably never have been inside the doors of a local congregation if they're just becoming believers in our day but nevertheless if they become true believers they are automatically members of the eternal church that will go on into eternity and uh, so the, uh, the we must bear in mind that when we think of the word church we always have to ask a big question is the Bible talking about the local congregation as he does uh, when uh, we read the word church in Revelation 2 and Revelation 3 where it talks about the church at Ephesus or the church at uh, Laodicea or and so on uh, that's a local congregation or uh, uh, or is he speaking about the eternal church and the only ones uh, or the any time it is speaking about those who are truly believers without any question we know automatically it cannot be talking about a local congregation because only some within that local congregation are true believers uh, the desire of the pastor the desire of the church rulers to have a saved membership is fine, but it cannot be achieved because nobody in that congregation can look into the hearts of each one and know for sure that the ones they're allowing to have to become members in full communion, as they speak of it, uh, are for sure the true are true believers. So nobody can see that in their hearts. And so we may never, never assume, never assume that any local congregation is only made up of true believers who are eternally the church of Jesus Christ. Well, thank you, England, for that provocative question. And now we're going to go to our first caller on our telephone lines. Good evening. Welcome to Open, to open Forum. Good evening, Brother Camping. Yes. Um, my question is in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, yes. verse 7 to 9. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 7 to 9. Would you turn your radio off? I believe we're getting some feedback. 1 <laughs> Corinthians 13, verse 7 to 9. Let's, let me take a look at that. 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, there is speaking about what love is. Love beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity, that's a, that's a, a, a word for love here. Love never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Now, what is your question? Um, verse, verse 9, where it says, For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. Is that speaking of the Bible prophecy only? Well, yeah, you see, the fact is that we don't have a full knowledge uh, anything like we will a uh, uh, full knowledge of the gospel or of God as we will have when we go to be with Christ when we go to be with Christ we're in his glorious presence and our knowledge of the gospel will be greatly enhanced uh, and and so on now the fact is that we uh, to prophecy prophesy means to declare the word of God so while we have a partial knowledge of the gospel, it is limited to what we can understand from the Bible as God opens our spiritual eyes and ears. Uh, that is what we can prophesy. We can't declare more than what we know. And so it's a, it's a partial 
declaration. It's not a full declaration. Now, when we get to be with Christ, uh, then, uh, like when we notice when it says, uh, when that is, uh, then when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. And uh, then it goes on in verse 12. For now we see through a glass darkly, that is, we see an incomplete uh, vision of uh, a story of what the whole gospel is, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And in other words, once, uh, once we have a, a much greater knowledge, we can also declare it forth with a much greater a, a, a greater praise to God. Of course, in heaven, we're not going to be prophesying uh, to an unsaved world. We're going to be prophesying, uh, just declaring the uh, glorious nature of God and the glorious uh, fact of who God is. So in the, in the congregation or at a crusade, when someone stands up apart from the Bible and prophesies it, is that that's what I well, but you see, prophecy uh, we, we that becomes a mysterious word. There are those who want to say that prophecy has to do with being able to foretell the future, or that they receive some special unction from God, uh, some special revelation, and now they're going to prophesy. Now the fact is, a prophet is someone who declares the will of God. Uh, in, uh, in the Old Testament, uh, there were only a few who were named as prophets, and normally uh, they had a very limited uh, written word from which to prophesy from, although occasionally someone would receive a direct revelation from God in a vision or a angel visitation or hearing a voice or however and that also could be prophesied now that we have the whole bible we know that the only thing we can prophesy is the word of god the this is the revelation god has given to us and we're not to look any other place for a message from god anyone who would stand up and say you know i received a prophecy this week uh, the Lord said to me, and he uh, is going to recite a vision, uh, the experience of a vision he had or a dream he had or, or, or what he thought was an angel visitation, immediately you would know, sir, you are, uh, you are not following the true gospel at all because that is an impossibility. If you did receive some kind of a supernatural uh, uh, message, some kind of a supernatural message, you can depend upon it, it would have been of Satan who comes as an angel of light. So tongues, seizes, as well as prophecies. Well, now tongues, that, that's a different matter. Now here, it's just saying that tongues... Uh, uh, would cease. It doesn't say when it would cease. This okay. this chapter doesn't give us any clue as to when tongues would cease. We have to find that in other uh, other places, and we know they ceased when the Bible was completed. That uh, because uh, once the Bible was completed, we're not to add to the words of the prophecy of this book. But this chapter will not give us any clue as to when tongues would cease. Okay. Thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Mr. Camping, I have a question. Yes. Um, the bull speaks of man's heart being utterly wicked. Can you, can you hear me okay? Yeah, go ahead. The, the Bible speaks of man's heart being utterly wicked. Is that true also for somebody who has truly become saved? No. You see, uh, the... Uh, the Bible says the heart of man is desperately wicked. Who can know it? That's from Jeremiah chapter 17. Or in the Gospel of Matthew, we read that out of the heart of man proceeds uh, murdering and thief stealing and all ma manner of wickedness. And, and uh, that is because unsaved men, and that's where each and every one of us was, uh, just because we're part of the human race, uh, the, we uh, we are 
uh, we are no longer energized by God. We're not indwelt by God in any sense. We are simply out there as a religious being, and and uh, in our hearts there is all manner of wickedness. It would be a lot more wicked if God did not restrain sin in our lives. But when we become saved, there's an enormous change. We receive a brand new resurrected soul in which, first of all, we are going to be energized by God, for, for it is God who works in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. And secondly, we're going to be indwelt by God. So uh, the, we can't say of a true believer that now his heart is desperately wicked. Now, it's true that he still has a body that lusts after sin, and that was not uh, that has not become saved as yet. That will not become saved until... Uh, the end of the world when he receives his glorified spiritual body but but uh, on the other hand in his soul existence which is a very integral part of his personality he's a brand new creature in which he never wants to sin and that is where he's going to be ruling his uh, personality to a very high degree because every time he falls into sin he's going to feel terrible miserable about that and he'll only be happy as he is trying to do it God's way more and more. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, brother. Uh, I call from Brooklyn, and I am from Albanian. I came here in, since, since 2000, and I'm born uh, in uh, 2001. Brother, uh, I want to ask you, uh, because I heard yesterday about the Catholic Church, but I am Christian, about the, it's not like a hundred percent like in the Bible, true, but I want to ask about the Mother Teresa. Uh, uh, how can I, uh, can I understand, like, uh, he, he's holding, she's holding the, the, the Bible or the, or the Catholic Church? Well, the, you see, the whole question is, can any church, whether it's the Roman Catholic Church or the Baptist Church or the Methodist Church or the Mormon Church or the, uh, or the Buddhist Church or the Mohammedan Church, can any church save us? And the answer is absolutely not. No church can save anyone. Only God can save us through His Word. And so we don't want to put any trust in a church. Uh, and in fact, the problem is, is that churches exist to a high degree by getting their constituents, that is, those who become members, to uh, vow that they will be obedient to whatever the church declares. They will, uh, they will consider that to be truth and that they will hold uh, faithfully to that. But unfortunately, there's no church that has all the doctrines are, are co completely correct. And, and, uh, and, uh, because, uh, and therefore, you end up trusting in doctrines that are not uh, to, uh, true to the Word of God. And that's one of the reasons, the big reason is, one of the big reasons why God's judgment is on the ch local congregations of our day uh, as uh, and he's no longer using them as a as a means of sending out the gospel he uh, God has finished with the local congregations and now he's working uh, with only with believers outside of the local congregations who are trying to be faithful to the whole Bible, the whole counsel of God, and their trust is only in the Bible and not in what our church teaches. Uh, the other question is, uh, I, uh, I am writers. I have write, uh, already two books, but uh, I now have uh, give to, to press these books because when I born again, I thought uh, uh, first I, I am to write for the Jesus Christ to explain the Bible like 
like you you do now or uh, other uh, brothers. But uh, uh, in in my church they said uh, I not believe to the brothers who who write the the the. They t the our life uh, too much with the Bible, but I don't know. I I agree with this or not. Yeah, well, your church, of course, will not agree with what we're teaching on Family Radio, because we're teaching that God is finished with the local congregation, and there's not one local congregation, one local pastor or elder or deacon who would be happy with that kind of an idea. Uh, they uh, they uh, recoil at that uh, because that means that uh, that uh, they'd have to accept the fact that their local congregation is under the judgment of God, which it is. It is under the judgment of God, but they cannot accept that. And and uh, uh, all we can hope for is that amongst them that is pastors and elders and deacons and church members who uh, that they might uh, there might be still a few that uh, that will get uneasy about what they're seeing that is going on in the local congregations and begin to search the bible to find out what is happening because only the bible gives us the truth we cannot arrive at any conclusions about what by what we see going on out there we have to look into the bible to find out what is really going on and hopefully there may be still a few who will come to truth and realize i've got to get out or maybe they'll start asking so many questions uh, that are are embarrassing to their pastor and uh, they will be asked to uh, leave the congregation because they're being a nuisance or they're being a troublemaker in the congregation that incidentally does happen uh, not infrequently in our day but thank uh, you uh, now to when I when I have started I have start now to, to study the Bible and to write uh, the book it's like the first pages, but uh, I can continue this, uh, which is your suggestion. Yeah, well, you just keep studying the Bible. Keep trusting the Bible, because the Bible is true. Now, a lot of it we don't understand, but on Family Radio, we do try to uh, uh, direct people into the Scriptures so they can have a better understanding. But right now, we're going to pause for this message. We're continuing with the Open Forum program, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Kip, and I have a question about dreams. Yes. Does the Lord speak to people through dreams? Because I've had a lot of dreams, and it came to pass. And I was wondering if the Lord is still speaking through people or letting people know things through dreams. Yes. No, that's not possible that the Lord is speaking to anyone today in any other way than through the Bible. The only way we can hear the voice of God is by reading the Bible. If we have a very vivid dream, and every night everybody dreams, Ben, sometimes we remember the dream more readily than other nights, uh, and sometimes our dreams are somewhat unusual and, and but normally a dream is probably our subconscious mind that is sorting out a problem that we uh, that our mind is uh, tussling with and that will become uh, the part of our dream we can use the dream as a guide for example if we be have a nightmare where we are frightened in our dream and we awake we can ask the question i wonder what i am so afraid of i didn't realize i was so afraid of something i i wonder what it is it may be that i'm uh, afraid of what the future may bring i'm afraid of judgment day coming or whatever or we may have a dream where we are committing sin oh yes we can commit sin in a dream and that is a giveaway to the fact that we're far more interested in that particular sin than we want to admit. 
and it's a warning to us, hey, uh, you better start uh, thinking about uh, uh, be being a little more careful in that area because uh, that sin is very close at hand in your mind and so on. But the dream is not a message from God. Now, in, okay. the, in the day, excuse me, in the days of the Bible, before the Bible was completed, yes, God would bring messages in dreams be, be, because the Bible was not yet completed. And so he brought messages through dreams or through visions or through angel visitations. All of that was possible. But not, none of that is possible now that the Bible has been completed for the last couple of thousand years. Okay, I have another question regarding, you said the church is under judgment. Does that mean that um, if you don't go to the local congregations, you're not under God's judgment? You know, this is such a terrible, terrible uh, uh, thing to talk about, but uh, Christ has used, he, he instituted the local congregations as a divine institution to uh, be the caretaker of the Bible and to send that gospel out into all the world. And yet, finally, the time has come, uh, and it coincides with the beginning of the Great Tribulation, which all the biblical evidence appears to point to the year 1988 as a time when God was finished with the local congregations and because of their growing apostasy uh, that is as they have been going farther and farther away from the truth of the Word of God uh, for example uh, the whole marriage institution is wrecked because the churches have decided you could divorce for fornication and then they went on from there and to a lot of other things uh, of that nature that were contrary to the word of god and uh they're they they they're all together uh gone astray insofar as what really is the meaning of salvation and so on and uh, and so god's judgment finally begins we read uh, with the local congregations we read in first peter chapter 4 verse 17 judgment begins with the house of god and uh, it, it, from there it will transition and is transitioning to the uh, end of the world when Christ appears on the clouds of glory and will take his seat on the judgment throne and all the unsaved beginning with those in the local congregations who are still there and who have come under the judgment of God they will be uh, uh, stand before the judgment throne and be found guilty and a, a sentence will be passed and they'll be cast into hell forevermore. So we're living in an ominous time, a terrible time, although on the other side of the coin, outside of the local congregations, uh, the gospel is still going out and God is saving a great multitude which no man can number. The Bible speaks of that and so uh, uh, for those who are outside of the congregation, there's great hope if they're still not saved, that they still could become saved. Okay, one last question. Does, is God's elect also going to be judged or not? If God's which? His elect, those he's already chosen, are they also going to be judged? No, anyone who is the elect of God, they were elected from before the foundation of the world, the Bible clearly teaches us this, to become saved. In other words, God obligated himself to save them. If there are any of God's elect still within the congregations, you can depend upon it that somehow they will be driven out or they will decide they have to come out uh, uh, because if they're not saved and they're still in the congregation, but they are one of God's elect, God will not save them there. The Holy Spirit is 
not working there to save people. So they will be driven out or they will decide they have to come out and uh, uh, because salvation is only possible outside of the local congregations. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Brother Camping, at the beginning of the program and uh, during the commercial breaks, your announcer says that this is a repeat broadcast of the Open Forum. You may want to tell the uh, audience that you're not in a repeat tonight. Oh, I see. Well, they probably have the wrong uh, uh, cue in there. I'm, I can't. I, I can't correct that. We just have to do, leave that be. Well, you just may want to tell the audience this way. You, uh, oh yeah, this is a live program <laughs> tonight. In, <laughs> in other words, I'm alive. <laughs> just in case you don't get any uh, calls, people uh, might be under the impression it's a repeat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If anyone's trying to call, they can certainly call tonight because we're not uh, repeating it. Yeah. So, so my question is, Brother Camping, during the various plagues and judgments throughout time that God has uh, done to people, there were always believers that perished in part of the plague, even though they were uh, elect and saved. Isn't that true? Is that true? That, uh, uh, for example, if a, if a uh, plague of... Um, famine hits a land uh, do the believers die just like the unbelievers within that land the answer is yes they they don't have any special unction that they're not going to die from famine uh, that's possible but you have to remember that for a believer to die is no trauma it is an enormous trauma for the unsaved because that physical death is the last step before their the fact that they will awake on the last day to find themselves standing before the judgment throne of God to answer for their sins and their physical death meant that there was no possibility that they would ever become saved since they were not saved at the moment that they died a physical death but on the other hand, here is a true believer, and uh, they are overcome by physical death. What is the, what is the uh, consequence of this? It's a glorious consequence, because the Bible teaches to be absent from the body, and that's what happens when we die, the soul leaves the body, is to be present with the Lord. In other words, they're leaving this world of woe and famine and hardship and, and sin, and instantly they're going to be in the glorious presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, Brother Camping? Yeah. Brother Camping, uh, let me interrupt. Um, what I'm trying to get the point is, is uh, if believers perished in many of the plagues and judgments throughout time, what makes what you're saying is the end of the church age that if a believer you're saying a believer can't be in the church at the uh, final judgment but yet throughout time during God's judgments believers were part of that judgment but they were still you know they were saved well the the you see what's happening today is a very unique judgment when God uh, and uh, and I uh, I'm sorry, I, I cannot quantify what I'm speaking of. That is, I'm trying to think if there's any judgments that have come upon the world. Uh, well, certainly, certainly. I mean, when we think, for example, when uh, Europe was devastated by, uh, by uh, uh, disease and about a third of Europe died uh, uh, several hundred years ago. Uh, it would, we'd have to be very naive uh, to believe that there were not true believers amongst them. But bear in mind, those judgments were not of the same order of the judgment that is now on the local congregations. The judgment that is now on the local congregations is an integral part of the final judgment. It is the beginning of the final judgment. All the other warning judgments that uh, the typhoons and the earthquakes and all the other 
uh, things that happened were were warnings, but they were not an integral part of the final judgment. But what is happening in the local congregations today, as God's judgment is upon them, is that it is the beginning of the final judgment. And that's a different matter altogether. Nobody who is a true believer is going to be uh, be uh, get be, be caught in uh, in uh, this final judgment. That's an impossibility. Brother Camping, weren't uh, true believers uh, under the judgment when, uh, like the lo- the plague, uh, biblical plague of locusts, or the uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, where the Lord rained fire and brimstone? Didn't believers die as part of that, even though they were saved? No, no. no. No, no. When God used those figures in in Sodom and Gomorrah, for example, there were three righteous, a Lot and his two daughters only that came out, and and uh, God had said, if there were ten righteous, I will not destroy this city, and uh, so there were no righteous. That was a picture of the final judgment. When judgment came against Pharaoh, for example. Uh, in the ten plagues, uh, again and again we read there was no judgment in the land of Israel. It was only in uh, the land of Egypt. And so God was very carefully distinguishing between those who were under the care of God and those who were not. So if I may, if I may ask you one more question, why is it that when uh, the Apostle Paul was getting the Word of God to write down it was infallible. He had the same Holy Spirit we do, but yet when we get the word uh, from the Bible, we're, we're subject to errors. Oh, well, but you see, when God says, holy men of old spoke as God the Holy Spirit moved them, uh, that was just not any uh, true believer. There were many true believers at any time in history. Uh, but there were certain individuals, Jeremiah in his day, or Isaiah in his day, and so on. Uh, and there, the sum total of uh, these individuals may have been fairly, fairly large, but nevertheless, there were certain individuals that God singled out to be uh, the scribe uh, to give us what God wanted us to hear in the Word of God. And uh, that was a very unique, uh, a very unique uh, situation that, of course, was never repeated once the Bible was completed. Okay, good night, Brother Camping. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Hello. Yes. Yes, I'm calling um, <clears throat> to ask you two questions. Yes. Um, number one, uh, when the church age, when Jesus was instructing Peter during the beginning of the church age, um, Jesus, you know, even as brilliant as he was thinking, a brilliant being as he was, he couldn't come out and tell people about this um, Feast of Tabernacle, the seven years stuff, and he didn't even mention that the year 2011 would be, even he don't even know the time and the year that God is coming. So uh, what you're trying to say is your mind is so brilliant, you're more brilliant than Jesus, the Lord and Savior, that to know that 2011 would be the year that Christ would come because Jesus didn't even calculate that that would happen, and he was the te- teaching this. Well, now, you got to remember that no one who is uh, a true child of God is ever going to teach beyond what the Bible uh, teaches. In other words, anything that we are teaching on family radio is derived from the Bible. It is not based on a on my brilliant mind. I'll tell you, if I had to trust my mind, I'd be dead in the water immediately. I have to pray every day, Oh Lord, I have no wisdom at all. Oh Lord, I, I, please give me wisdom because I don't have any wisdom. I don't trust me at all. I can say that very candidly and very honestly. But on the other hand, when God wrote the Bible, he did not write an empty book. 
He did not just write a lot of words. Uh, he wrote with a great purpose and with a teaching purpose. And and the uh, the c command is that we're to compare spiritual things with spiritual, and uh, we're to be pray to we're to pray that the Holy Spirit will lead us into truth and so on. And uh, therefore, yes, after a while, we will begin to be able to conclude this and conclude that and base it entirely upon the Word of God. And just to lash out and say, oh, now you're trying to show how brilliant your mind is, well, uh, that doesn't prove anything at all because it doesn't, it, it, that isn't where it comes from. It comes from the fact of carefully, carefully uh, reading the Bible and reading the Bible and I would suggest to you sir I would suggest to you spend more time reading the Bible carefully slowly there's a lot of information there and and start puzzling over a few verses and and uh, pray the Lord that he might give you wisdom about a verse or two and uh, that's that's then you'll discover that yes there is something we can learn from the Word of God. My second question, I, I had another one afterwards, but um, I, it's funny that after I, I had called a month ago and I was telling you about um, the 125 years that uh, God gave man and you um, uh, agreed that um, Noah, that was the time that God gave Noah. Is nowhere in the Bible recorded that uh, he gave Noah, he spoke with Noah and told Noah it would be 125 years. And if you look at the year from the time that the flood came and from the time that um, it ended, it was like 100 years in which Noah, you know, was recognized in the Bible. Now, you said um, earlier that everything that family that came from you as a revelation it came from god am i right everything that came from you is actually from god well excuse me all i'm saying is is that i uh, uh, what i what family radio teaches or what i teach is is based upon the Word of God as right. we carefully examine Scripture with Scripture. In, in other words, you'll notice on this program that again and again people will ask me, uh, where do you read this or where do you read that? And I will never, you'll never hear me quoting from a uh, theologian of some kind. Uh, although there are many, many theologians that are re recognized and honored, but they are not the source of truth. Every time uh, someone uh, asks me the question for the source, I will try to quote from the Bible, because it is God who has to tell us. Uh, any any time we read the Bible, that is the Word of God, and that's what we have to listen to, and that's the only truth that I know about. And so, uh, I, that's all I can say to you, and that is that, uh, as you hear uh, any teaching on family radio, we hopefully can back it up with Scripture, not with uh, some man's idea. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yeah, hi. How are you? Very well, thank you. Yeah, I wanted to ask, um, how did the Bible actually get to come be put together? How did it come to get together? You know, yeah. we don't know. We really don't know. It's very interesting that... Nobody has ever, tr that is, I'm not aware of anybody coming up with any idea of how the Old Testament came together, for example. And yet, uh, and yet, uh, we know the books that belong in the Old Testament. And when we look at the books that are in the Old Testament and examine each one very carefully, uh, we can see why it is a part of the Bible. Likewise, when we look at the books of the New Testament, uh, I don't know who put them together, but I do know this, that as we examine each and every book of the New Testament, 
they, like the books of the Old Testament, uh, are, have, give clear indication that they were written by God. They, the the, the, the uh, depth of uh, knowledge that they teach, the character, the, uh, the way they are written and so on, it all uh, fits together as the Word of God. Now remember, the Bible is God's Word, not man's Word. It is God's Word. And if He is the author of the Bible, you can depend upon it that God is going to make sure that the right books got into the Bible. Uh, you know, God is the creator of the world, and, and He's so careful in uh, when He creates animals and plants and fish and, and, uh, and so on. And uh, why shouldn't He also use great care as He is putting together the Bible to make sure that it is exactly the word that He wants us to hear? And that's what He has done. So we don't have to doubt for a moment that this is the Word of God. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, yeah, how are you? Very well, thank you. Okay, let me radio now. Yes, I would like to know, you know, according to the book of Acts, you know, many people have been teaching that, um, you know, Jesus had made an ascension into heaven. And I would like to know exactly um, what does that mean? when it says that um, he was taken up and a cloud had received him out of their sight. How did he ascend? Uh, no, you're, we're having some breaking of our line, but I think you asked the question, uh, let me see if I got it correct. Uh, how are we to understand when Jesus was taken up? We read in uh, Acts chapter 1, I, I believe I, I understood the question, in Acts chapter 1, uh, um, yeah, Jesus has taken the apostles with him uh, to the, uh, um, uh, let me see, uh, was it to the Mount of Olives, probably. And, uh, but in any said in verse 8, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked, steadfastly toward heaven as he went up behold two men stood by them in white apparel which also said ye men of Galilee why stand ye gazing up into heaven this same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven now incidentally there are a lot of people who get the idea that Jesus went up into heaven in his human body uh, like he had on this earth and when he returns that's what we're going to see no he will come uh, as a definitely appearing as an individual but he will be in all of his glory uh, he uh, he will certainly be a, a coming individually no question at all about that and everyone will recognize that he is the judge of all the earth and so the unsaved will be trembling they will be calling to the hills to uh, hide uh, to uh, uh, the caves to hide them and the rocks to crush them because they are will be frightened out of their skin knowing that now judgment day has come but uh, uh, how all of that is going to uh, finally work out, I don't know. I don't know. The Bible doesn't give us enough detail so we can get any more uh, that we dare to say much more about that. But shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, good afternoon or good evening. Yes. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is in the divorce and remarriage that's all being taught in the churches nowadays. Uh, one of the doctrines that when, when you deal with someone that is divorced and remarried 
and you say that God recognizes that as a present marriage. Is there any scripture that you stand on for that, or the only scripture that we can offer on that is and that is is that in the Old Testament, remember the the principle of uh, two, uh, one man one wife has with, began with Adam and Eve from the beginning. It this was the plan that the two become one flesh, and yet God gives extensive. Uh, uh, references to people who had more than one wife, like uh, uh, Samuel's mother was a uh, uh, second wife. Uh, there was also a first wife in that marriage, and and there are other illustrations. And God, uh, and uh, there's other language in the Bible where God recognized that second marriage as being a legitimate, that is a legal, not a legitimate, but a legal marriage. Uh, with all the rights of a first marriage, even though it was contrary to the will of God. But hold on, I'll be right back with you right after this message. We're continuing with the Open Forum program. This question about a God recognizing a second marriage or a third marriage is, uh, is uh, uh, not an easy one to answer, although uh, we have to read everything in the Bible, and then we see that uh, it's still a marriage, and there cannot be divorce after marriage, even though it is a wrong marriage to begin with. But wonderfully, when we become saved, then all the sin connected with that second marriage, like all the sin that went with the first marriage or any other sin in that person's life, and there's a whole multitude of sins that has all been covered by the blood of Christ so that that person still stands uh, completely exonerated uh, simply because Christ has paid for all of the sin. Uh, that I, I, I understand where you're at there, and I, I kind of feel partly that way, and I kind of feel also partly whenever you define repent and looking at it as an adulterous union, and particularly now with where we are at in the United States with uh, homosexual marriages. Well, homosexual, uh, excuse me, they're not marriages. Well, well, yes, okay, I understand that, but now is that not... We've, we've married them as far as the... That, excuse me, they have nothing to do with a, a, a marriage that, a, that God recognizes. That a homosexual marriage is a, uh, is a total misnomer. It has uh, two men cannot marry. Oh, they can, they can set up their own uh, definition of terms if they wish or two women uh, joining together and calling that a marriage. They can call that a marriage, but in God's sight, it is not a marriage in any sense of the word. None. Okay. Yeah, that's a complete abomination. Right. It's a total violation of everything. But, but you know, in a way, we... Uh, <laughs> We kind of look down our long noses sometimes at the homosexuals because of the antics that they're engaging in, and yet I, I think everyone in the local congregations has to hold, hang his head in shame because where did the breakdown of the marriage institution begin about 50 years ago? 50 or 60 or 70 years ago, it was very seldom that anybody thought about a divorce. You just made sure your marriage worked. And it's very rare that someone got a divorce. But today it's common as grass. And how did it all begin? And I know the churches don't like to think about this, but I was part of it. I, I was right in the heartbeat of the local congregations while this change was going on. And it was the local congregations that made the decision that, yes, God does allow divorce for fornication, and uh, which was a complete violation of the Word of God. And once they made that, broke out that uh, guardrail from the marriage institution, that opened up all kinds of other 
uh, openings for, for the breakdown of the marriage relationship. And so the whole marriage institution is a shambles, and it has to be laid right at the foot of the local congregations. We can't blame the homosexuals. We can't blame the the uh, uh, the Hollywood uh, people. We can't blame anybody. We have to blame our local congregations ourselves because. And I can tell you, I was part of that. I I was an elder at the time when I, the denomination I belonged to was uh, struggling with that question, and I gave my assent to it because I didn't know any better. I didn't realize how how terribly wrong that was, and and uh, I'm only glad that God forgives sin. But the fact is that uh, we don't have to look at the homosexuals to see how bad sin is. All we got to do is look at the, at what has been happening in our local congregations. I agree with you a hundred percent because I know the uh, the percentage of the statistics of it. I think is around sixty percent of the people in the churches is, are married and or you have been divorced and went yes. through those type of problems yes uh and i wanted to say also that one of the uh issues that drove us from the churches is that issue because of the second book of john and the way it it teaches that you will partake in the sin even if you say god bless you uh, and that's, that's second, the second book of John. But I have yeah. another question yes. dealing with uh, 1 Corinthians 11. In your book, The Open Forum, uh, you state that the Bible does not teach anything on a hair covering or that it is not to be, the woman is, not, is taught not to be covered. Is that correct? That a woman is not to be what? Is, or that the Bible does not teach that a woman should wear a covering. The Bible does not teach that a woman has to wear a covering. No. Uh, how do you uh, how do you deal with the First uh, Corinthians eleven? Now? Well, we have to deal with that spiritually altogether because you know it says when a woman prays or prophesies, she is to have her head covered. All right. Now, when what is what is uh, praying? Any and your a woman is to pray without ceasing. In other words, she can pray. While she's taking a shower, she can pray while she's doing the dishes. She can pray while she's uh, 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 engaging in any kind of activity. Does that mean that every time she prays, she's got to quick get a covering for her head, a, a, some kind of a cloth or a scarf or, or a hat or something? Uh, that doesn't make any sense at all. That what how what kind of spiritual activity is that? And uh, prophesying has to do with declaring the word every time she teaches her children uh, something from the Bible. And uh, does that mean first she's got to quick run and get a, a, a head covering, and then she can uh, then she can uh, uh, t uh, teach them something from the Bible? No, we know that doesn't make any sense at all. That covering is simply a figure to indicate that she must recognize that Christ is her covering and and uh, if she if she, if she is uh, if she is uh, going to go out on her own then it's like she was would be bald in other words uh, uh, it uh, it would indicate that she is in rebellion but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please good evening welcome to open forum Yes, hello. Yes. Ex uh, Exodus 20, verse 8, please. Exodus 20, verse 8? 8 to 10. Exodus 20, verse 8. We read, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Yes. Well, what is your question? Well, it says uh, the seventh day is a Saturday. Is that... The Jewish Sabbath. That was the Old Testament uh, ceremonial law that God uh, in introduced. Remember in Exodus 31, and he, we read there that he says, I have given you the Sabbath that to show that I, the Lord, will sanctify you. In other words, just as you are not to do any work on the seventh day Sabbath, so when you try to become saved, don't think that you 
can do any spiritual work to get yourself saved. A very, very uh, telling incident is found in Numbers 15. In Numbers 15, where there was a man who, uh, who uh, we read in Numbers 15 in verse 32, and this is God speaking now. These are the words from God's mouth. And while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day. And they that found him gathering sticks brought him unto Moses and Aaron and unto all the congregation. And they put him in ward, that is in jail, because it was not declared what should be done to him. And the Lord said unto Moses, The man shall be surely put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. And all the congregation brought him without the camp and stoned him with stones, and he died as the Lord commanded Moses. Now, that's, that's what God is teaching us. Now, why is he teaching us this? This man was, was not building a fire. He was not cooking food. He was not uh, building something. He gathered a few sticks, a tiny, a minor infraction of the seventh day command, thou shalt not do any labor. And why did God have him put to death? Because he is a picture of anyone who is trying to get himself saved and believes, yes, God does most of the work of saving me. He went to the cross and paid for my sins. But I have to also make a tiny contribution myself. I have to accept Jesus, or I have to believe on him, or I have to re repent of this or that sin. And only then will I become saved. And it's like someone picking up a few sticks on the Sabbath day. You're still under the wrath of God. And so uh, this, this is really describing uh, what the purpose of this, uh, of this uh, uh, seventh day command was. And that is that God is teaching that I, the Lord, sanctify thee. Remember I quoted from Exodus chapter 31. Exodus 31, uh, verse 13, God declared, again, these are the words from God's mouth, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily, my Sabbath ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am Jehovah that doth sanctify you. In other words, it is pointing to the fact that I did all the work to get you saved. And, and so uh, uh, you, uh, uh, you remember this every, Sunday, every Saturday when you don't do any work. And then when we go to Colossians 2, God says that, uh, that, that that Sabbath was like the new moons and the other feast days. It was a shadow of things to come. And uh, uh, but the fact is that we don't. Uh, once Christ came, we don't observe that seventh day Sabbath anymore. God shifted to the first day Sabbath, and that is not part of the ceremonial law. That is a day when we are to only do God's will, and it's a day for sharing the gospel and for studying the word and so on. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Brother Camping. How are you? Very well, thank you. Okay, Brother Camping, I'm hoping you could maybe give me the spiritual meaning of a couple of very strange verses in the book of Ruth. I'll at least try. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I just lost my page now. Okay. Uh, verses 16 and 17, where Naomi... Uh, nurses uh, Ruth's baby and then the women also say to Naomi Naomi had a child I'm wondering why Naomi would nurse uh, Ruth's child and then call the child her own well because Naomi in that in that uh, beautiful beautiful uh, story uh, is a picture of ancient Israel 
And that child was a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ that came from the marriage of uh, Boaz and Ruth because uh, Boaz and Ruth were in a genealogical line on the way to the Lord Jesus. And, uh, and uh, it is uh, uh, Israel that gave, in a real sense, gave birth to the uh, uh, Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, beautiful. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, yes, um, I'm calling because it was a uh, person that called. I was just wondering, uh, how can people sit here and take a uh, uh, believe? Because you told people that you preach basically from the Bible according to the scripture. Um, the book of uh, Jude, Jude talks about scoffing in the last days, people without the spirit of God. And um, before you used to preach that interracial marriage shouldn't be. I mean, to listen to you would be like listening to a clang. Okay, how can well, we now wait, excuse this? me, wait a minute, excuse me. I never did teach. Please, don't try to put words into my mouth. I did never teach that an interracial marriage was not to happen. I, I've always taught that there's nothing in the Bible that prohibited it an interracial marriage. Although early on, before there was very much interracial marriage going on, I said, well, you want to be con consider the consequences of all this, however, because it will impact both your families, and the, those are serious matters that you should consider. But I never, never, I'm very confident, I've never taught that the Bible said that an interracial marriage was not, uh, was not bi uh, biblical. And, and I, you know, I, why do you, why do you people come on with lies, uh, or maybe, maybe you didn't know it was a lie, maybe you just perceived that I had said that, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt, but go ahead with your question. This, this was something that was noticed by a number of callers that called in and said that this is what you used to teach, but you changed. Um, and not only that, but, uh, this, this thing about the seven year jubilee, I mean, this is something that, that was squashed during the Old Testament. Uh, how are you going to keep, keep continue that from the Old Testament into the New Testament? Well, you know, it's interesting. That's a good question. You know, it's interesting that uh, God gave the feast days of the Old Testament, and they carry over into the New Testament. For example, we have the uh, the uh, we have the uh, Passover day. Now the Passover day was instituted and observed by the Jews, and and uh, yet it was on the very day, the very day of the year, that Israel was a, uh, was killing the lambs for the Passover uh, observance according to the Old Testament ceremonial law that Jesus, the Passover lamb, was hanging on the cross uh, where he had become a curse. Uh, he uh, was, uh, had, was giving his, he was the burnt offering for our sins. Then we could say, well, okay, but that's still part of the Old Testament. But then Christ went back to heaven. Okay. Uh, the next feast day after the Passover was the Feast of Pentecost that happened 50 days after the, uh, after the uh, approximately 50 days after the Passover. And lo and behold, uh, uh, that Pentecost day was anticipating the uh, pouring out of the Holy Spirit. And lo and behold, in A.D. 33, about 50 days after Christ, uh, after the Passover, 10 days after Christ went back to heaven. So we're no longer in the Old Testament era. We're in the New Testament era. The Holy Spirit was poured out on that very day, Pentecost Day, that Israel was, was uh, uh, observing their ceremonial feast day. And so the same, in other words, God is showing us very clearly 
that the Old Testament feast days and where they came in the year, precisely where they came, does identify with new with the New Testament era. And so when we look at the Jubilee, for example, and we know that 7 B.C. was a Jubilee year, and then we advance that on down through uh, as time, we are not surprised, therefore, when 1994 ends up as a Jubilee year and all kinds of very significant things uh, from the Bible identify with that year to show why it is a Jubilee year. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hey, good afternoon, Brother Company. How are you? Very well, thank you. Uh, I want you to read for my, uh, you know, and uh, friends, uh, seven disabilities, and then uh, uh, Hebrew 9, verse 8. Uh, he- Hebrews 9? V- verse 8, yeah. Verse 6? Verse 8, 8. Let, let me turn. Hebrews chapter 9. Verse 8. 8. 7, 8. 7, verse 8. eight. Yeah. Okay. Hebrews 9, verse 8. Okay. Uh, the Holy Ghost. Uh, uh, let's. Uh, let's. Uh, 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 let's get the context here. And it's talking here about the Holy of Holies, and into which the uh, high priest went alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that uh, the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while well, as the first tabernacle was yet standing. Now, what is your question? You you got Ibo Ibo nine that is it. If if the old old stammer were for flesh, it, it would have been necessary to have been new to them. Well, you see, what what God has done is he set up types and figures and patterns in the Old Testament. And, uh, and in the temple, as well as in the tabernacle that existed before the time of the temple, there was the holy place where the altar was, where the burnt offerings were offered. But then there was also this special room called the Holy of Holies. And in this Holy of Holies, uh, there was the, uh, the uh, ark uh, the, in which the law of God had been placed. And uh, above that ark was the uh, mercy seat, a covering, a golden lid over the top of the ark. Uh, that was a golden, the ark was a golden, a beautiful golden box. And then above the mercy seat, or above the lid that was on the, this ark, there were two cherubims that uh, that uh, had wings, and they uh, they uh, uh, looked down on the ark, and and they looked at each other, and uh, they filled the space of the whole holy of holies. Now the high priest. Uh, it was the only one who could ever go into that Holy of Holies. No one was ever, ever to go in behind that big curtain that separated this special room, which was a very, quite a large room. Uh, uh, from, uh, in fact, in the temple, it was about 30 feet uh, by 30 feet by 30 feet. It was quite a large room. And, uh, and nobody, and even when the a high priest went in there. It was only one t- one day a year on the Day of Atonement, and before he went in there, 
all the other priests were uh, uh, not to be in the in the outer room so that nobody could look in there uh, accidentally in any way and even the high priest would burn incense so that as he is going to open the curtain that incense would be a cloud of smoke that would obscure the cherubim and the ark but his purpose was to sprinkle blood on the on the ark on the lid or the mercy seat which is the what the lid was called of the of the uh, of the uh, ark of that golden box and then he would close the curtain and uh, for another year it was not to be looked in there again now what was going on in there in that holy of holies was a a picture of God's salvation plan the the uh, uh, the uh, ark uh, was a picture of the grace of God and it, but in, and inside of it was the law of God and uh, and uh, the two cherubim were a picture of God as the judge and God is looking down on the law and the law has to do with every human being with you and with me and uh, and according to the law of God it as he looked at us humans he found us guilty 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 but between the cherubim uh, as they gazed down at the uh, at the inside of the ark there was this g mercy seat or this golden lid and that represent Christ as the savior that he that he stood between the God as the judge and uh, and God as uh, and, and the law of God which we have broken. Excuse me. And so, I uh, but all of that was very obscure. It was not understood at all. But then Christ came, and. And when he came as the one who came to pay for our sins, it's like that holy of holies was brought, was open wide, so that it's now known that uh, that Christ is the mercy seat. He is the one that that has stood between us and the law of God. And and this is what it's being talked about here in Hebrews chapter uh, nine, as it is, or chapter eight as it is uh, or chapter 9 as it is uh, indicating that now God's whole salvation plan is made manifest that is it is much more readily understood than it had ever been understood during the Old Testament era could you read 8 7 for me verse 7 says 8 7 Hebrew 8 7 uh, 8 7 but aren't into the second that is the Holy of Holies the high priest went alone once every year not without blood which he offered no. Hebrew 8 7 Hebrew 8 7 Hebrew 8 7 I am yeah. oh, oh excuse me uh, excuse me I was reading Hebrews 9 7 now let me read yeah, 8 7 for if that first covenant had been faultless then should no place have been sought for the second now the first covenant was had to do with that serum all those ceremonial laws we're talking about and uh, and uh, they the whole gospel was obscured in it but now comes the the uh, the new covenant that is God Christ himself is the covenant and and uh, we see clearly what God's message of salvation is but with that I have to say good night my I'm sorry I would I could wish I could have looked at that verse a little more quick earlier I'm sorry uh, right now I have to say good night because we've come to the end of our time until our next open forum May the Lord richly bless you. Good night.